optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start to shake. Can I ask you a personal question? Now I would have seen an appropriate time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Onnit. I have used Onnit products for years. If you look in my kitchen, in my garage, you will find Alpha Brain, chewable melatonin for resetting my clock when I'm traveling, kettlebells, battle ropes, maces, steel clubs. It sounds like a torture chamber, and it kind of is. It's a torture chamber for self-improvement. <laughs> and you can see all of my favorite gear at onnit.com forward slash Tim. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash Tim. And you can also get a discount on any supplements, food products. I like Hemp Force. I like Alpha Brain. Check it all out, onnit.com forward slash Tim. The Tim Ferriss Show is also brought to you by 99designs. 99designs is your one-stop shop for anything graphic design related. You need a logo, you need a website, you need a business card or anything else. You get an original design from designers around the world who submit drafts for you to review. You are happy or you get your money back. And I have used 99designs for book cover ideas for the 4-Hour Body, which went to number one New York Times, for banner ads. And you can check out some of my actual competitions at 99designs.com forward slash Tim. You can also get a free $99 upgrade if you want to give it a shot. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim. Hello, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to a very special episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where each episode I attempt to deconstruct world-class performers to find what makes them tick, the tools and tricks that you can use in your daily life, ranging from professional athletes, to chess prodigies, to billionaire investors, to, in this episode, that's right, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the man himself, the governator, the terminator, the man who killed the goddamn predator people. This was an amazing experience for me. Of course, there are many things that I associate with my upbringing, if you want to call it that, in the 80s, Guns N' Roses, but of course, there's Commando, there's Predator, the list goes on and on. This man is a force of nature, and I had the opportunity, the rare opportunity, to visit him at his home in Southern California at the kitchen table. We dug into everything, and I really wanted to dig into areas that had not been explored widely in any other interviews that I could find. And that ranges from the art of psychological warfare. He is a master. How did he apply that? What phrases did he use? Questions did he use to get inside the heads of his opponents? We cover that. What was his most lucrative movie? I'll give you a hint. Twins. How the hell did that happen? Well, there's a lot that goes into the backstory of that. How did he make millions of dollars fresh off the boat before his acting career took off. A lot of people don't realize he was a millionaire before his acting career took off. How did that happen? We dig into it. How did Arnold use meditation for one year and just one year to completely reset his brain and prime the stage for massive success? And of course, mailing cow balls to politicians, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. This was an amazing episode. I want to let you get right into it. The show notes, links, all that good stuff will be found at 4 Hour Workweek, all spelled out, 4hourworkweek.com. Click on podcast, or you can just go to 4hourworkweek.com forward slash Arnold. And without further ado, please enjoy a wild romp through the life of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Kind sir, I wanted to start with a thank you for welcoming me to your house, number one. But number two, I felt awkward all morning because I don't know how I should address you. And I wanted to ask you how I should address you. Well, you can address me any way you want. You can call me governor, governor, schnitzel, Arnold. <laughs> okay. But I think Arnold will, 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 be, will be right. I'll go with Arnold. Yeah. It's, it's, I felt like my first year in Japan when I was 15 because I didn't know how to address anybody. Uh, so I figured we could start with... Uh, a favorite topic, well, it's become a favorite topic as I've been thinking about this, which is big balls and cow balls and bull testicles. So you've mailed uh, sculptures of bull testicles to people before, is that right? Well, there was one 
incident uh, in uh, particular that was when I was governor, <clears throat> and there was uh, you know one of the the leaders, the legislative leaders, Daryl Steinberg. Uh, and I, we both had a huge challenge. Uh, California was hit by an enormous, uh, you know, economic decline. There was a worldwide recession that was hitting us in 2008. And everyone kind of was caught by surprise of what effect it had. That all of a sudden we had $20 billion less in revenues. Therefore, we had to make big cuts in education and in various different areas that really hit the vulnerable citizens. Um, of California. And so when we did the budget, I basically sent him up before we negotiated, you know, a set of balls. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of just with a note, I say, I hope you have that when we negotiate the budget, because that's what we both need, but what we all in this building need uh, in order to get this budget done, because it's not going to be a pretty budget, because People will hate it. They will hate us. You know, they'd be making those cuts, but it's all the money we have. And so he didn't take it lightly. You know? <laughs> did he take uh, it well or did he take it seriously? No, no, because he took it seriously. <laughs> he, he kind of like, uh, what happened is, is I've, like you said, I've done it before. And um, it's kind of things that I do. You know, I do always, uh, you know, pranks and people and <laughs> jokes and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, but it's always kind of meant with a sense of humor. Right. You know, so it's always when you, and I always have this uh, tendency that when things get really intense and when people start, you know, freaking out, I try to make a joke or something to, to lighten things up and just say, look, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to look at this day and laugh about it. Right now, it's very serious. And then now, we, you know, we have to, you know, really concentrate on this. And we have to do something that we don't feel comfortable, whatever the situation is. In this case, at the Capitol, this was the situation. It was a terrible situation that we were in economically. And I thought they would loosen it up before the, the legislative leaders come down, uh, you know, to my office and we start negotiating. And it just didn't go very well. I mean, he felt insulted and he felt hurt and he felt, how could I do this and all this stuff. Uh, you know, so I said, no, I said, look, I'm sorry. I did not mean it that way. I don't think it's so seriously. It was meant to be a joke. And stuff. <laughs> so it's just, just things happen, you know. Now, you've, you're no stranger to adversity, of course. I mean, you grew up in a very small village in Austria. Uh, you had, I think, uh, the splash toilet or what was the uh, the nickname for it? The Basically uh, a chamber pot. A, 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 a sponge toilet, oh, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and basically it's, it's like an outhouse, but it is in the house. And, uh, you know, you sit there and, uh, you know, and you hear, uh, maybe a second later after, you know, uh, <laughs> you go number two, you hear them, they plutch, you know, so that's why they call it a splutch the toilet. And, uh, and so that was a common thing. Um, in, 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 uh, old buildings, our building was like 200 and some years old. And um, th there was, uh, you know, there was no uh, uh, flushing toilet and there was also no running water in our house where I grew up. And so we had to get basically the water from around 100 uh, to 200 yards away uh, from a well that we had to pump. And uh, winter and summer didn't make any difference. And uh, we had to carry the buckets of water uh, to our house, to our kitchen. And then it was used very sparingly. We drank from that water. We washed ourselves with that water. There was no shower, so we washed ourselves with washcloth and with, with soap. And there was a whole kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, everyone had their position. My mother went first and washed herself. And um, then it was my father's turn. And then it was my brother's turn. And by the time I w washed myself, uh, the lavour or that base where the water was in, was pretty black, you know, so it was not pretty anymore. <laughs> I maybe got more dirty Best from the water than I, than I actually cleaned myself. Good idea to drink first. Make sure yeah. you sate your thirst but, first. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about it was it was, you know, other places had exactly the same situation. We were not the only ones, so we didn't feel like kind of, wow, you know, we, we are really growing up poor. As a matter of fact, I never felt when I was a kid that we were poor. 
I always felt like we were like everyone else because we were surrounded by farmers that had very little money and they had little farms or workers, the working class where workers made actually less money than my dad. And my dad didn't make much money at all because he was a police officer and there was much more the benefits, the, you know, the, the, the pension that you get in the healthcare and all this stuff, uh, but not much salary, just enough that my mother could buy to buy the groceries and to buy some things and once a year to buy clothes at Christmas time for us or to knit some clothes for us and stuff like that. So, But I mean, there was like the neighbors were living the same way and everyone, when I went to school, all the other kids were kind of in the same boat. And it, which brings up a, a question for me that I've always wanted to ask you related to confidence because I was looking at, of course, I think your name is almost synonymous with confidence for a lot of people. And people look to you to try to borrow confidence, and that's part of the appeal of a lot of your movies and your successes. But I was looking at a very old photograph of, I think, your first major bodybuilding competition in uh, Stuttgart. I think it was the Junior Mr. Europe. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this photograph, and what stuck out to me was, if you, we had just looked at the faces, not the bodies, it was so clear to me that you were going to win and that you knew or believed you were going to win. Your face was so confident compared to every other competitor. Where did that confidence come from? My confidence came from my vision uh, because I am always a big believer that if you have a very clear vision of where you want to go, then the rest of it is much easier because you know always why you're training five hours a day. You always know why you're pushing and going through the pain barrier and why do you have to eat more and why do you have to struggle more? Why do you have to be more disciplined? And all of those things become much more clear. It's not like, oh my God, I have to do another you know, 200 sit-ups. It's more kind of like, I can't wait to do another 200 sit-ups because that will get me one step closer to have the apps that I need to win that Mr. Universe. And that's my goal. I see myself clearly on that stage, winning the Mr. Universe. I see myself very clearly of getting the trophy, standing there with the trophy, raising it above my head, and having hundreds of bodybuilders around me, kind of below me on stage, uh, looking up and idolizing me, including the thousands of people that are watching the event. So that was always my clear vision, and that always inspired me uh, to go all out. And so when I went for a competition, you have to understand, I went uh, from the uh, to the junior Mr. Europe during my time in the military. And so what it took for me to go and to get on that train, Besonenzug, uh, which was a people's train, meaning kind of like it was not a Schnellzug, at the, you know, the fast train. It was the slow train that literally stopped in every train station to let workers off and to bring new workers on. And that's what the train was. And so with that, you went to, all the way to Stuttgart because it was the cheapest way of going. Because didn't, I didn't have you, much money. And you didn't get hit by any customs officers or anything like well, that. Well, we, we got hit, but I mean, we, we got through it, uh, right. you know, and... and um, I didn't have my passport because you had to give up the passport when you go into the military, right? So, oh, oh you, 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 you pass. I didn't even have a passport. Passport we got afterwards when we were finished with the military. But I mean, so it, we got through and we got to uh, the Germany, uh, the Stuttgart. And so there was this will there that no matter what it takes, and even if I have to crawl uh, to Germany, that I will be there at that event because that was my shot when I saw the ads about this Mr. Europe Junior competition, Best Gebauter Athlet Europas in German. And, uh, and th that was my opportunity to really go and to make my first kind of uh, entry into an international competition. And I felt that, uh, you know, I can win it. And that's what I was there for. I wasn't there to compete, I was there to win. And uh, and so that's why you saw that facial expression. There was a certain arrogance there. There was a certain way that, that I posed with the other competitors. I always felt during the pose off that I had my act together much more than the others did. And then I'm gonna, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, make them feel inferior. And uh, and I will win. And I will look facially and physically to the judges that I'm the champion. So you touched on something I really want to dig into, which is the, the, the psychological warfare 
of bodybuilding, of life in general. I really feel, and this is a compliment, I mean it as a compliment, a, a real master. And if anyone who's watched Pumping Iron or, or anything, I think, comes away with one, that as a takeaway. Uh, how, did you, how did you develop that? And for instance, when you were, I guess, 17 or 18, uh, how did you get inside the heads of those people at that point? I think that it, it uh, came about when I trained in the gym, I always felt that people are kind of really vulnerable uh, in certain areas. So that someone that comes to the gym and works out because he wants to have a better body, that he most likely will be vulnerable, and that's during conversations that I discovered in Munich when I was a trainer in the gym. They were vulnerable when you said something like, well, you, you're fat. <laughs> well, it was, it was, it, it was not like a, even a, a, a doubt in anyone's mind. If 10 people would have looked at that guy or 100 people, they all would have said that that guy is fat. But he was outraged. He said, what? Uh, uh, do you really think I'm that fat that you're mentioning it? I said, well, you're in the gym. I, said, I go to the doctor's office and say, I have a cough. I don't go and beat around the bush. I say, I have to tell him what the problem is, and then he can give me the medication. I say, this is the same thing in the gym. I say, you come here because you're fucking fat. And so, that, that, <laughs> let's, so now let's solve the problem. And so there's no beating around the bush there either. And so, you know, so I could see that they were kind of like shriveling up and kind of shocked. So I could see the vulnerability. And then I, I tried different lines on people, and you know, we we'll talk about the, the hairline, uh, or we we'll talk about the hair color turning gray, or so, and then they it would just freak out, you know, about little things like that. So it was natural that with all the experience that I got now being a trainer and working with people and all this, that I learned about people's psychology and about their weaknesses and their strength and all this. How do you build people up? Because my whole thing was, let's first discover and talk about the weakness, and then let's go and rebuild everything. And uh, so that was the idea to give this guy a six pack, to make him feel great, to declare victory by next summer, that he can go to the beach and that he can go and feel proud of himself and feel great and all this, and then continue training. So that was the idea. Uh, so it, by the time I came to America and I started you know, competing over here, uh, it was very clear that when I said to someone, um, let me ask you something, is it, do you have any knee injuries or something like that? <laughs> and then they, they, would, they would look at me and say, no, why? why? No, I have no, no knee injury at all. No, my knees feel great. And I said, I said, why are you asking? I said, well, because your thighs look a little slimmer to me. I mean, I, I, I thought maybe you can squat or maybe there's some problem with leg extension. I said, this is really? And then I saw them all for two hours in the gym, always going in front of the mirror and checking out the thighs, <laughs> if the thighs still exist or something. Like that. So, but I mean, this is, you know, people get, people are vulnerable about those things. So, Naturally, when you now have a competition, you use all this. Yeah. And so they, they use, you ask people, were they sick uh, for a while? You know, why did they look a little leaner? Or that, they, you, know, uh, you know, did you take any salty foods lately? And they say, why? I said, because it looks like you have water retention. I said, it doesn't look as ripped as you were like a week ago. And so so that, that throws people off uh, in an unbelievable way. And they get and they, defensive. And they, and, and they walk away kind of like, oh, this didn't bother them at all. But then you, you can see, you watch them as they walk around the pump-up room. And when you warm up for the competition, and you could see them kind of thinking to themselves, <laughs> kind of then going to the mirror and checking it out <laughs> secretly and all that stuff. So, you know, it works. So I just slowly developed it because I always felt that sports are not just a physical thing. As a matter of fact, I felt that the, the mentality and the mental strength in sports and the psychology in sports is much more important than the physical thing because in reality, I mean, I see when I watch a Mr. Olympia competition or Mr. Universe competition or any of those things, you know, they all look pretty much the same, the top five guys. But what makes one emerge is, is the way he acts. If he acts like a winner, if he seems smiling, having a great time on stage and those. So I felt you know one should use the psychology, one should use everything uh, in as far as food supplements is concerned. Uh, you know, use your best, best you know posing trunks. Uh, use uh, you know uh, try to use the sun out there and work out in the sun so you get tanned all around. Uh, use the best posing routine. Just really give me a ten of everything. Then you have a shot of winning. 
and to, and psychology was definitely part of that. And you developed this this arsenal of uh, intimidation through the the bodybuilding. Did you use that, for instance, uh, in movies, waiting in line to audition against other people who were going into audition or anything like that? Did it did it, did it apply to to show business? I never auditioned. Okay, never. Uh, it, it would because. Um, I would never go out for the regular parts because I was not a regular looking guy. So my idea always was, okay, everyone is going to look the same and everyone is trying to be the blonde guy in California, going to Hollywood interviews and then looking somewhat athletic and cute and all this. Uh, okay, how can I carve myself out the niche that is unique that only I have? And so I always felt like really strong about you know, I have to get into the movie business like Reg Park did, or like Steve Reeves, or Paul Winter, or Ma- uh, uh, Larry uh, uh, Gordon, and, and all those uh, in a, uh, all those guys that were in the muscle movies in the in the fifties and sixties. That's the way I'm going to get in there. Of course, you know the naysayers were right there, and they said, "Well, you know, this time has passed. This was twenty years ago. Uh, you look too big. You're too monstrous." Uh, too muscular, you would never get in the movies. So that's what producers said in the beginning in Hollywood. And that's also what agents said and managers. They said, I doubt that you're going to be successful in that because today's idols, I mean, this is not the 70s, Arnold. Today's idols are, you know, Dustin Hoffman, Al Pacino, uh, Woody Allen. I mean, look at this, these are all little guys. You know, those are the sex symbols. Those are the hot stars. Look at you, you weigh 250 pounds or something like that. This is, that time is over. And, um, but I felt still very strongly and had a very clear vision that the time would come where someone would appreciate that. And then sure enough, you know, um, when, uh, people saw me on talk shows, they got inspired directors like Bob Rafelson and then, you know, bought the script of uh, stay hungry, uh, the book of stay hungry and had it written into a script and then did the movie with me because he believed in me that I had the personality and I had a certain strength and um, a certain kind of a look that would be great on the screen, that the ca- the camera loves me uh, and all that. And so it worked. I did Stay Hungry. I did then Pumping On, the documentary. And, uh, you know, I did uh, the, the Streets of San Francisco and uh, worked then with Anne Margaret and with Kirk Douglas and the villain. And then all of a sudden I got the contract for Conan the Barbarian. And uh, bang, there we were, twenty million dollar movie, which today will be a, a equivalent of a two hundred million dollar movie. Um, and Dino De Laurentiis producing, Universal Studio, an international studio, uh, you know, uh, financing the movie. And uh, so it was. And John Milius, a uh, first class director, directing it. So my whole plan worked, and I was so right. Even John Milius, after he has done the movie, he said, "If we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger, we would have had to build one." Because of the body. And when I did Terminator, uh, Jim Cameron said, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger and we couldn't have done the movie because only because he sounded like a machine, <laughs> was it so believable that he actually played a machine? And that's what, where people bought in. When he says, I'll be back, it's totally different than when I say, I'll be back kind of thing. <laughs> so, so, so here was the greatest compliment that the, the very things that they, the agents and the managers and the studio executive said would be a total obstacle, became an asset, and uh, my career started taking off. So the the not auditioning is really interesting to me, and I I knew you were very successful in real estate, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you had basically made become a millionaire in real estate before your first movie. Is that right? Not before the first movie, before my career took off. Got it. So I did not rely on my movie career to make a living. Because that was my, my intention, because I saw over the years the, 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 the people that worked out in the gym and that I met in the acting classes, they all were very vulnerable because they didn't have any money and they had to take anything that was offered to them uh, because that was their living. I didn't want to get into that situation. I felt like if I am smart with real estate and take my little money that I make in bodybuilding and with seminars and selling my courses uh, through the mail order and orders, um, I could save up enough money to put down money for an apartment building. And uh, I realized that in the 70s, the inflation rate was very high. And therefore, uh, an investment like that is like unbeatable because buildings that you know, I would buy for 
five hundred thousand dollars, you know, within a year were eight hundred thousand dollars, and I only put maybe a hundred down. So you know, you made three hundred percent on your money. So you couldn't you couldn't beat that. So I quickly developed and traded up my buildings and bought more uh, uh, apartment buildings and office buildings on Main Street down in Santa Monica and so on. And uh, the investments were very good, and it was just one of those magic decade. Uh, the day you couldn't do it in that same field. There's another field in real estate where you can do that. But in this particular field, I don't think you will see those kind of jumps ever again. And I benefited from that, and I became a millionaire from uh, uh, my real estate investments. And that was before my career took off in uh, show business, in acting, which was after Conan the Barbarian in 1982, that movie came out. We shot it in 81, and in 82 it came out. So from that point on, my career took off because people saw you know, that the movie was successful at the box office. Then you know, I signed a contract to do Conan number two, and uh, you know, then that led to a contract you know, with... Uh, uh, for Terminator One and then Commando and it, it, you know then the action genre, right. also there was another fortunate thing. Each of those decades offered something very fortunate that was a little bit beyond my control, but I benefited from that. You know, so that there was the action genre that all of a sudden took off in the eighties with Stallone and Van Damme and uh, all those guys uh, coming in. Uh, really was terrific, and you know our salaries went. You know mine. I got like a million dollars for Terminator 2. And then all of a sudden, by the end of the decade, I made $20 million. That's incredible. And uh, so to, I wanted to talk about the mail order for a second because that was done with, with Franco Colombo? Or? No, the, 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 uh, with Franco Colombo, who, for those that don't know, is a European, was a European champion in powerlifting and also a boxing champion and then became a bodybuilding champion. And then he, I brought him over here with uh, Joe Weider's help uh, to train with me here in America. But at that point, there was no money in bodybuilding. That's a key thing that everyone has to understand. Unlike the day where the top bodybuilding champions make millions of dollars, in those days, there was no money in bodybuilding. And so when we didn't have enough money, we literally had to go to work. And so Franco and I, since Franco's talent was to be a bricklayer, and a very skilled bricklayer, uh, and learned that in Italy and in Germany, uh, we were able to go and start thinking about the idea of putting an ad in the LA Times, creating a company, and calling it European Bricklayers and Masonry Experts, <laughs> uh, Marble Experts, Building Chimneys and Fireplaces, the European style. And this was also a time where everything that was European was huge in America. So we benefited from that, you know, Swedish massages and everything had to be kind of a foreign name or oh, Japanese this and this. So Europe and Japan and all these places, you know, were used, the names were used because for some reason or the other people just thought that was better. And so we used that in the ad and we put the ad in the paper and literally a week later, we had the big earthquake. <laughs> uh, in in Los Angeles, and I mean the chimneys fell off the the, the apartment <laughs> houses and all this stuff, and they had cracked walls and all this. And so Frank and I, we uh, as a matter of fact, one of the friend of ours, wife, who was very smart and she worked in a supermarket, um, she did uh, answering the phones and calling people back and all this. Uh, just to make sure that our English doesn't get all screwed up with uh, talking over the phone and all this. And, uh, and, and so she gave us then the addresses and then we got to do the estimates and I was kind of like set up to be the math genius and that figures out the square footage and that Franco would play the bad guy and I played the good guy. And so we would go to someone's house and then someone would say, well, look at my patio, it's all cracked. Can you guys put a new patio in here? And I would say yes. And then I would run around with the tape measure, uh, but there would be a tape measure with centimeters. And no one in those days <laughs> could at all figure out anything with centimeters. And we would be measuring up and I'd say, well, this is, you know, uh, four meters and uh, 82 centimeters. And they had no idea what we were talking about. And this is so much. And then we would be writing up formulas and the dollars and the amount and, and, and square uh, centimeters and square meters and all this stuff. And then uh, I would go to the guy and I said, well, uh, I said, um, it's $5,000. 
and the guy will be in a state of shock. And he says, it's $5,000. I said, this is outrageous. I said, I mean, I didn't think that this is, well, what did you expect the, the, the basis? I thought maybe it's like two, three thousand dollars is about 5,000. I says, I said, let me, said uh, let me talk to my guy. I said, because he's really the masonry expert. I said, but I can beat him down for you a little bit. Yeah. Let me soften the meat. And then so I would go over to Franco and we would start arguing in German. You know, this is eine Schweinerei. Du kannst nicht so viel verlangen. Das ist ein Blödsinn. Wir arbeiten hier in Amerika. And this would be going on and on. And he would be screaming back at me in Italian and some, some stuff. And then I would be, then all of a sudden he calmed down and then we'd go to the guy and say, Phew. okay, here it is. I said, I could get him as low as three thousand eight hundred dollars. I say, can you go with that? And he says, thank you very much. He says, you know, I I I I really think that you're a great man. And <laughs> blah 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 and all this stuff. I say, okay. I say, give us half down right now. We go right away and get the cement and get the bricks and everything that we need for here. And we can start working. I said, a Monday. And the guy was ecstatic. He gave us the money. We immediately ran to the bank, cashed the check you know, to make sure that the money is in the bank account. And then we went out and got the cement, and the, the wheelbarrow, and the, all the, the stuff that we needed and, uh, and went to work. And so we worked like that for two years. I mean, very successful. As a matter of fact, on the end, we had uh, various different jobs where we employed like 16 different bodybuilders all the laziest bastards that you can ever hire, but never the, because they all were interested in working outdoor and getting a tan at the same time for their bodybuilding competitions. <laughs> they were not interested in working. <laughs> but anyways, we all had a good time. We all made money. And, uh, you know, for, and this is actually then, I did this until I started my mail order business. And then that became the new source of extra income so we could afford everything and then save also some money and so on. And uh, so I've, well, I shouldn't say of course, but I've, I've followed, followed you since I was a little kid. Uh, also, Franco, though, I remember watching the replay of the World's Strongest Man competition with mm -hmm. the refrigerator right. walk when his leg gave out. But I was always impressed by how, uh, how strong he was for his weight. I mean, I think he deadlifted more than 750 pounds at less than 190 or something like that. Well, he did with uh, 730, he did like five reps. That's just yeah, amazing. So, I mean, it was like... Uh, and... How, how uh what are the reasons the two of you have remained uh remained friends for so long i think we both come from europe uh i think we both were struggling in the beginning i met franco the day of the mr europe junior competition that same day he won the powerlifting championships in the lightweight category and uh so he was up there on the stage getting his trophy I was up there on the stage getting my trophy, and then the category of bodybuilding championship of the world passed 18 years of age, uh, which they, they called a senior division, but it was not really senior what they consider now here senior, being over 45 or whatever it is. But I mean, then it was just someone that was older than 18. Um, he was up there, the winner on stage. So there was all three of us on stage, and then you know, uh, Franco worked out in Munich, and I said to him, I said, uh, I want to come to Munich, I want to work out in Munich um, after the military is finished. And, uh, and you know, Franco said, well, you know, I'm, I'm there. If you ever come, he says, let's work out together. And I told him that I admire powerlifting, that I do powerlifting and weightlifting and bodybuilding, and I want to work out with him and get stronger. And so when I basically moved to Munich, uh, Franco was one of the first guys that I went uh, uh, to see and ask him if he wants to be my training partner. Now, Franco didn't train as much as I did at that time, uh, so I used several training partners, but Franco was one of them. And we just developed a really a great friendship because he was a foreigner in Germany. He was a what they call a Gastarbeiter, and yeah. so I was considered a Gastarbeiter. Gast you know, I mean, a, a, a kind of a guest from the outside, from Austria coming to Germany. And uh, you know, we developed a really close relationship. So we trained for two years together. He helped me with the powerlifting. I helped him with the bodybuilding. And then uh, by 1968, I moved to California, and I convinced Joe Wheeler then to uh, give Franco a, a, a airline ticket. And bring him over here that he would not regret it that he is really what i am in bodybuilding except in a short uh, man uh, category the champion he's like 
the ultimate. I said, there's no one better, and he's a great strong man. I say he bends steel bars and blows up hot water bottles and breaks wood and steel and everything. I said, he's a crazy guy. I said, and his tremendous power. I said that if he has this sunshine here and the training equipment and the food supplements, I said that he will blow everyone out of the water. I mean, it would just, it would be unbeatable. And that's exactly what happened. Franco came here in 1969 and we trained together and he won every championship after that. He won Mr. Universe and Mr. World and then eventually uh, even Mr. Olympia after I, I retired. And we always worked that together. We always were very good friends and very supportive and everything and uh, even the day. And I'm very proud of him because he spoke no English. Unlike me who spoke a little English, he spoke absolutely none. And he went then and passed the entrance examination to the chiropractor college and uh, went and with me to take some classes at the community college and uh, got his English better and his, uh, his commander with the language, then passed the, the entrance examination at the chiropractor college and then become, became a chiropractor and passed his board the first time. Not like some of the guys that I worked out with in the gym that tried it two or three times and then finally passed it the third time. So I was really proud of him at that. And then he was just became an expert in uh, actual manipulation and working with the body. He had a special talent for that. And that's why he has so many patients today. Well, I remember uh, watching his just catastrophic leg explosion on, on video. And then he's calmly laying on a stretcher and he says, well... Just by looking at my leg, I can tell it's not broken. It's a dislocation. He went on, and people thought he was, was – doctors included, as I understand it, thought he would never walk again. And then he came back, and after he retired, I guess in 80 or 81, he won – that's when he won the Olympia. That's right, yeah. I mean, it, it, were, it was one of those unfortunate things that, that the Universal – the back lot where they did the strongman act, there was a hole in the, in the road oh, uh, at that parking lot, and uh, no one saw it. It's you know, it was just one of those unfortunate things. And um, you know, Franco had to pay for it uh, for that mistake of, uh, that the organizers made. And um, you know, but he came back. I think Franco knew that I had a few years before a heavy knee injury. Uh, in 72, uh, when I hurt my knee down in South Africa, um, doing squats and posing. And, and uh, I came back from that knee injury and my thighs were bigger and better and more cut in 1973 at the Olympia and I won the Mr. Olympia. So he knew that you can come back that if you have a great surgeon and if you have great therapy after the surgery, that you can come back and be better than ever. And so that's exactly what Franco did. And, uh, you know, he he went through his surgery, he went through the therapy and came back, and then he was squatting again with his 600 pounds, like at great ease. <laughs> so incredible. Uh, I want to talk about language for a second. Uh, when is the last time you spoke German privately in a conversation? I sometimes uh, speak with a friend of mine, Ralf Möller, who is a German. And uh, so uh, we sometimes speak German and um, sometimes I, I would say it's a mishmash between German and English because some words are more accurate in German and some words are more accurate in English. Or it's easier to use in English. It's, uh, you find more specific words in English. So we sometimes do, uh, you know, like I said, a mixture of, of both. Yeah. So, and then Franco also speaks German. And so sometimes he will, we will be talking in English and then all of a sudden he will get, get into a German uh, thing and then all of a sudden we talk German <laughs> and the same is also with my nephew who is now a prominent uh, entertainment attorney here he came I brought him over when he was 18 uh, from Austria and uh, from Portugal um, he speaks Portuguese and he speaks German and French and uh, also English now really well since he has been here all these years and uh, he also sometimes slips into the German, and then we talk in German, and sometimes in English. It's a, it's a, it, 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 so every so often I get to speak German also. Well, I enjoyed uh, listening to on audio Total Recall, your mm -hmm. book, and uh, you threw in Gemütlich, uh, Gemütlichkeit, yeah, and then kept on moving, and I was like, oh, I like that because I, I lived in Berlin for a short period of time, right, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, and and also, also in uh, the Escape Plan. I used the German, and uh, you know we did this whole scene 
uh, in, in, in German. They're going crazy. They're going crazy in German. So that was fun to do and all that stuff. But, you know, the Austrians uh, have a different dialect. It's kind of the Austrians are like Southerners. Right. You know, where people say, huh, what do you say? You know, kind of thing. So that the people, people that have to hide German or they live up more north, right. that speak more and more perfect. Like when you go to Berlin, it's like totally like the way you write yeah, it. Hochdeutsch. The German. Yeah, Hochdeutsch, exactly. Uh, now, I, I was having a conversation not too long ago with um, Ariana Huffington. And she was telling me about a conversation she had with Henry Kissinger because she was taking uh, accent reduction classes. And and Kissinger just said, said no 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 you want to keep your accent that's right uh, so I wanted to ask you you've taken accent reduction classes before but was there a, a point at which you know you realized wow this is actually a strength I don't want to get rid of this well the object uh, the objective was not to get rid of the accent when you take accent removal classes and dialect classes and English classes that whole combination. It's all designed that you speak so everyone understands you. Sometimes people have a tendency, foreigners have a tendency of pronouncing a word so wrong or with such wrong emphasis that people don't know what they're talking about. And then when you correct them and they say it the right way, then you totally understand it and, and, and you're perfectly fine. So the, the trick is really to learn how to enunciate and how to really speak the, the language well and how not to rush uh, and throw words together that makes it then almost impossible to understand. Uh, so Henry Kissinger is right. Everyone will always remember Henry Kissinger because of his accent and because of his brilliance. And I think everyone will always remember Ariana Huffington for her accent and for being this woman that set out the goal of creating this magazine and uh, and and being highly successful and uh, being always politically oriented and policy, you know, becoming a policy wonk and all those kind of things. But there are many of those, but what separates her is the accent. Yeah. You know, the way she talks, you know, and uh, she's Greek. And so she has, of course, a different accent than I have, which made it really funny during the debates when we had the gubernatorial debates in Sacramento. She was there in the whining with her Greek accent, and I was there <laughs> talking with my German accent and all this. It was hilarious. It just showed, you know, how far, you know, kind of the world has come or California has come that all of a sudden you have two of the top candidates, you know, all foreigners, you know, <laughs> with foreign accents in order for running for governor. So, so the... I've been very fascinated to look at your your film career and hear the story of of twins. So I was hoping maybe you could tell us the story of twins, how twins came together, and how you guys structured that deal because I didn't know anything about that. Uh, well, twins came together because I felt very strongly that I had a side of me that is a very humorous side, and that if someone would be patient enough and willing to work with me as a director that they will be able to bring that humor out of me. And that's, you know, um, something that is very difficult because you can be humorous in your private life but cannot pull it off in a movie. There's many actors that have tried that uh, and were not successful. So I felt, you know, that I should really uh, talk to Ivan Reitman because I really loved Ghostbusters. And I said to myself, God, it was so well directed and, and all this. And I just happened to run into him um, when I was in Aspen. And uh, we were hanging out. There was uh, Robin Williams and some other people. And uh, we were all up there at Snow Mass and we were skiing. And then at night and before dinner, we all had a great time sitting by the fireplace and choking around. And Ivan Reitman would say to me, uh, Arnold, I, says, you know, I listen to you and I see a side of you that has never really been on screen. And I said to him, I said, uh, you know, I, I would love to do a comedy and I would love to bring that side out if it is the innocence of me or the naivety of me or the humor of me, whatever it is. I said, I would like to see that on the screen. I said, I think it could be good. And then he said, okay. Um, so I said to him, I said, I want you to work with me and to direct me in a movie. Let's figure out what it should be. And he said, okay, I would love to do that. I'm going to go home after Christmas, after this vacation, and I'm going to look into uh, and develop a bunch of ideas. And then 
uh, you and I get together and then pick the, the one that we like the best. He developed uh, immediately, within a short period of time, a bunch of ideas. I think there was five ideas. And the one that we both liked the most was called uh, The Experiment, which then became Twins. Experiment we didn't like because of my German-Austrian background, so we thought that it would be better to call it Twins. And, um, uh, and we developed that project, got it written, I came up with the idea then of uh, Danny DeVito that it shouldn't be just someone that is acting totally opposite of the way I am, but it should also look physically totally opposite of the way I am. And uh, Ivan loved that idea, and then we went after Danny DeVito, and I remember we sat there in the restaurant and we made a deal on a napkin and wrote down, you know, this is what we do. We're going to make the movie for free. We don't want to get any salaries. And we get a big back end, and they should, Ivan should take this deal to the, and with the agent to the studio. And he took it to Tom Pollock, who was then running uh, the Universal Studio. And um, Tom Pollock said, "This is great. We can make this movie for, you know, sixteen and a half million dollars if this guy, if you guys don't take a salary, um, and you get a big back end. We're going to give you thirty seven percent of whatever it was uh, together between Danny, Ivan, and me." And uh, and we worked out the percentage of what our salaries are. So whatever Danny got at that time for a movie versus what I got for a movie and versus what Ivan got for directing. So we worked it out percentage-wise, and that's how we ended up dividing up the part amongst ourselves. And let me tell you, I made more money on that movie than on any other movie. And the, the, the gift keeps on giving. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just wonderful. And, uh, and, and, and I remember Tom Pollack, after the movie came out, he said to me, he says, all I can tell you is, he says, this is what you guys did to me. And he bent <laughs> over. He turned around, bent over, and he put his pockets out. And he says, you fucked me and cleaned me up. <laughs> he said, so it was very funny. He says, I will never make the deal again. <laughs> that was funny. But anyway, so the movie was a huge hit. It came out just before Christmas. And throughout Christmas and New Year, it made every uh, day. Uh, three to four million dollars, and uh, which in today's term it will be, of course, you know, double or triple. Uh, but it was just huge, and it just went up to 129 million dollars domestically, and uh, I think worldwide it was like a 300 and, uh, 260 million dollars or something like that. So it was really very, very successful, and it, like I said, it uh, it ended up costing I think around 18 million dollars the movie. Amazing, to make. so yeah. amazing. Now you know, I was when. When I hear a story like that, I think of the deal that George Lucas did for Star Wars, where the studio's like, ah, toys, whatever, sure, yeah, you can have the toys. <laughs> and then right. they probably felt very much the same way. They're like, wow, we're not going to make that mistake again. That's right. Uh, now, you have um, a new film. Uh, you have several, but Maggie. And uh, I'd love to, for you to tell people about it, but I was also curious... Maybe you could comment on this, but in this day and age, why why you don't say finance an entire film yourself or crowdsource all the financing yourself? So you're the only, uh, not necessarily the only producer, but you're the the sole owner of that film. Yeah, I I for some reason or the other um, always felt that I should keep the two apart and I should not invest and uh, put money into films. Um, this is a whole other business to be in to finance movies. And um, I think that, uh, you know, my strength is to be a performer. I think there's people out there that are very good in financing movies and raising money for movies or people that run studios and all this and I let them do their job, what they're doing. I do my job, what I'm doing. And this is why I just never did that. Uh, it's, it's something else if someone has a great idea to do a documentary or something like this and says, this costs $2 million. Uh, you know, can you help us with this? And I feel passionate about it. Like, for instance, uh, you know, a Brooklyn Castle. You know, if someone would have come to me and said, uh, hey, uh, here's a, a you know, documentary we want to do about after school programs in inner city kids, I said, well, wait a minute. These are two things I'm very passionate about. I love playing chess, which is what it's all about, right? The, the documentary, uh, how kids in the, in the cities play chess and how they become smart and how they stay off the streets, therefore not get into trouble with teenage pregnancy and the juvenile crime and all those things. And they have adult supervision and they, you know, they get confidence. And there's a kids that are 70% of them are below the poverty line. So that's a great story, and it is something that both of them, Jess and Inner City Kids, after-school programs, they feel passionate about. So I would have put money into that. Um, 
and I wouldn't have been in it. I would have just you know done it because I think it's a story that ought to be told. And uh, so things like that is something else. But in my own movies, I don't know. I never felt comfortable with that idea. Keep them separate. Yeah. You know, now that I think about it, I, I do a lot of investing in startups, and sometimes people ask me, why don't you start your own startup? And I basically give them a very similar answer. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm already heavily concentrated. I'd like to keep the two very separate. That's right, yeah. So I'm glad you brought up um, Brooklyn Castle. So a friend of mine was was interviewed on this podcast named Josh Waitzkin. He was the basis for searching for Bobby Fischer, so uh-huh. very well known as a chess player. And uh, I've heard you talk about the, I think it's the 3 to 6 p.m. is the danger zone. Uh, and I'm on the advisory board for DonorsChoose.org and a number of nonprofits related to education. Why are you so passionate about after-school programs? Uh, because I felt that when I grew up, even though we were very poor, but I had someone there 24 hours a day for me to improve, to learn, to do sports, and to get attention, and to get the love, and to get the discipline. It was tough. Uh, upbringing, uh, but it was a combination of you know great discipline um, and also l- uh, love, and uh, but I felt like that that having someone there with you, twenty four hours a day from the time in the morning you get up to the time you go to school and there were the teachers there and there were the the coaches there and the, there was the school principal and all of them and then you go home and there's your mother there helping you with your homework and then in the evening your dad comes home and he goes takes you to the soccer field and the sports with you and in the winter ice curling and all those things so i just felt when i watch and go from school to school which i did when i was the chairman of the president's council on physical fitness and sports i traveled through all 50 states and visited one school after the next and i always at three o'clock i felt like these kids are going out there and then I saw half of them standing around in front of the school and then wandering around. The other half were getting picked up. And I said to myself, what happens with those kids out there? And the, 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 the teachers or the principal will always say, he says, well, you know, the problem today is, is that so many parents are working. Both of the parents are working and they don't have really the ability to pick up their kids from school. And what happens is a lot of these kids then get into trouble, you know. And so then I started looking into it. The idea of after-school programs, and I, and I saw that there are after-school programs around, but they're not really well organized. And so I stepped in. I started after-school programs here in Los Angeles. We very quickly then spread them all over California and then all over the United States. And now we're in like 13 or 14 cities uh, all over the United States, including we're in Hawaii. And, um, and they have been really beneficial. And we even passed an initiative in California uh, 2002, which was the After School Education and Safety Act that provides an additional $500 million for after school programs in California. And because of that, which started going into effect in 2006, from that point on now, every high school and middle school in California has after school programs. And then also churches and other organizations that are not connected with the school can also get money for after school programs uh, so they can have their after school programs so it really has uh, become one of my passions and it's it's just simply like i said i had that upbringing i had the attention 24 hours a day and it helped me to be who i am and i felt bad for the kids when they don't get an equal shot because the only way you can be successful is if you really get this kind of attention and if you don't get kind of into a situation where you float around on the streets then you get involved with gangs and with drugs and with with violence and 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 you know like i said teenage pregnancy and you commit juvenile crimes and uh, you end up in jail it doesn't serve anybody and it costs the community a lot of money and the way i got republican support for that in California and had them endorse my initiative was because I showed to them that for every dollar we spent, we save three dollars down the line. And so from a fiscal point of view, they endorsed it. Even though they don't like the, you know, the nanny state thing and to have government step in and do the job for parents, uh, the Democrats endorsed it for that. They thought that government right. is responsible and we ought to do something because it's, it's the new challenge that 70% of the kids come from homes where both of the parents are working and they do not have time for the kids in the afternoon. So 
Who is helping this kid with homework? Who is helping this kid with tutoring and with sports programs and adult supervision and giving the kid the love that the kid needs and the confidence building that the kid needs? And for that, after school program is the number one answer to the problem. We have seen it over and over what great success rate we have had with after school programs. And hopefully the movement will grow and eventually every child will have the opportunity to join an after school program if they don't have a parent at home that can help them with all those things. And everybody listening, I'll obviously provide links to all the organizations that Arnold's involved with. And I encourage you and implore you to consider becoming involved supporting or becoming a mentor or a big brother or sister of some type. Uh, I grew up on Long Island and I had, I was a competitive athlete. I was a wrestler for a very long time and that kept me out of trouble. And I can see how easily both of my parents worked. Many of my friends growing up there uh, ended up overdosing on drugs, becoming involved with drugs because they had idle hands during that period right. of time. Right. But the, the, the other thing you have to understand is when you are a foreigner, an immigrant, and you come over here and you enjoy the unbelievable opportunities that America has to offer. It is natural that you feel like you want to give something back. And I felt like when I was the chairman of the President's Council and then when I was a trainer for the Special Olympics uh, and then with the after-school programs, it was my way also of giving back uh, because people listened to me because at that point I was a celebrity already and I had a tremendous power of influence because of my movies and all that. So I might as well use this power of influence for something good and also give something back to the country. And that's why I always ran for governor and all this stuff. So I think it just feels good to do something for people that need help. That's, you know, what life is all about. Totally agreed. And, and for those of you out there who have, read my stuff. I get asked by readers a lot, uh, you know, what's what's the key to happiness? And I think if you're not sure of how to make yourself happy, make someone else happy, help someone else. And uh, the payback is enormous. Uh, Arnold, when you hear the word successful, who's the first person who comes to mind? I think that um, people like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Larry Allison, Elon Musk, I mean, people like that, right? Because it's it's the first thing that you do think of when you, th you hear about success, that, that, that they're really worldwide known for their success. But then there's another, there's other layers, you know, like for instance, you know, you cannot avoid someone like uh, Nelson Mandela, who uh, showed to the world about forgiveness and showed to the world about tolerance and inclusion. And the, the job that he did in South Africa was not only a great job for South Africa, but it was a great job for the whole world because it inspired everybody to be li remotely like that. And no one can really be like that but because he was really very, very special. And I was very fortunate to meet him twice and to, to work with him in Special Olympics in South Africa and to be at his prison cell uh, in Robben Island and uh, have, have him show me around and all this. And I had time to talk with him and spent a day with him twice. So so he's definitely one of those guys, or Mikhail Gorbachev. I mean, someone that grows up under communism and then when he's on the top, realizes that the system doesn't work and then dismantle it. I mean, think about the 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 chutzpah that it takes, right, yeah. to, to do that. It's extraordinary. Didn't need to mail, him. Need to mail him any yeah. bull testicles. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> unbelievable leadership, you know, and and vision and all that. Uh, or if in sports, I mean, if you think about Muhammad Ali, how can you not think about success and not think about him? Because that guy was so successful, but also not only successful in sports, but also in generosity. I mean, he gave everything away. I mean, he will go through the airport and if he sees someone that there's no money, we'll give him a $100 bill. And so he was an extraordinary athlete. So there's a lot of people like that. I think that when he goes through history, also there's someone that I just thought of that I should mention that is Cincinnati. And he was a Roman emperor and uh, in the Roman uh, Empire. And uh, he... Why I admire him, and as, as a matter of fact, uh, Cincinnati, the city is named after him because he was a big idol of George Washington also. And the, the reason why he is a, a great example of a success is because he was asked reluctantly to, to step in into power and become the emperor. 
and to, to help because the Rome was about to get annihilated by all these wars uh, and battles. And so to step in there and to help them. And he was a farmer, powerful guy. And he went, took on the challenge, took over Rome, took over the, the, the army, and um, won the war. And then after he won the war, he has felt that he has done his mission why he was asked to go and be the emperor. And he gave the ring back and went back to farming. And he didn't only do this once, he did it twice. <laughs> they went back later on to him once again. And when, when they tried to overthrow the empire within, and they asked him back, and he came back, he cleaned them up the mess it was through great, great leadership, which he had a, a tremendous leadership quality in bringing people together. And then again, he gave the ring back and went back to farming. That's and incredible. to be, as it, we all know, it's very addictive yeah. to be powerful. And it's very addictive. And I know how difficult it was for me to uh, let go of being governor. And then all of a sudden, you're not sitting there and making decisions about what's going to happen, you know, the, the financial crisis, what's going to happen to the regulations, the greenhouse regulations, what's going to happen, you know, to our, you know, high-speed rail, what's happening with the university, and you're not there anymore, you know, making the decisions. So it's very hard to let that go. So imagine someone like that to let go, to be the emperor. It's a whole yeah. different thing. And so, so to me, that, so that's very admirable. And then when I think about success, he's also somebody I would put in that category. I'll have to do some more research on yeah. him. Uh, do we have time for just a few more questions? Sure. Um, so feel free to not answer this if you don't want to, but this is almost the opposite of the last question. When you think of the word punchable, who's the first? what's the first face that comes to mind? Punchable? I, I, I never even thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Most people see? don't walk around thinking about it. No. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I mean, okay. So... I don't think there's anyone that I can think of right now. <laughs> okay. I was worried thinking about asking this that you might just reach across and knock my front teeth into the back of my head. But uh, the is there a particular, do you have a favorite book or a book that you've given to people as a gift the most? Well, there's one book that I have actually, since it was just Christmas, that I've given away a, a lot of copies. And this is a, a book about Winston Churchill by Mayor Boris Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's the mayor of London, and he's a real interesting character. They think that he could be eventually prime minister of England. Um, very talented guy, not a party servant, but a people servant. And he came up with the Boris bike uh, that has now bicycles all over London that you can that anyone can just take and ride around with the bikes. And then now they have this in all over Europe, in France, in Paris, in Vienna and everywhere. They all took this idea that people would drive less in the city if they have the possibility Bicycles. to just get a bike from a bike stand. And so he's a very interesting guy. So he, I did not even know that he is, you know, this extraordinary writer at the same time. Uh, but I was in, in London for a promotion and I saw on the bookshelf in my suite this book, Winston Churchill, and of course I admire Winston Churchill, is one of those guys that I really love. And so I took this book down from the bookshelf and then I looked and I said, oh, Boris Johnson, the mayor, he wrote it. I said, I got to get that. So I put it back and then uh, Daniel wrote down, uh, uh, say, Oh, oh yeah, okay, so there it okay, is. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, so we wrote down the title and we wrote down, you know, all, all the information, and then we uh, we got it as a Christmas gift for a lot of people. But the other book that I have given, I mean, hundreds of copies to is "Free to Choose" by Milton Friedman, and it kind of lays out why um, the private sector is really the answer to a lot of the problems that we have, and not government. And uh, I think it's a real great uh, kind of a a, a, a a philosophic kind of a book about how to approach our problems, if it is education, if it is economic growth, and all of those kind of various different issues. Uh, you know, he lays it out. It's a very simple book to read, but it is very good, and it has an, it makes an impact on you when you read it. And the other one, I think, is um, California by Kevin Starr. Well, Kevin Starr was our librarian, a state librarian, and he has written more books on California than anyone. So if anyone is at all interested in uh, a book about California, you know, 
what makes California unique and special and the history of it, and the political history of it and all the little details. I mean, that's a good book to have. So it's a, it's a, it's a great gift, especially when I was governor and you, you give people gifts and you give it, of course, of California, a book about California and so on. So that's, uh, you know, uh, the kind of reading that I like and that I like to share with other people. Wonderful. I just one more question, then I'd love to hear where we can learn more about all of the projects that you're up to. Uh, and that is, I've, I've heard you mention transcendental meditation in passing briefly. Do you meditate? Um, I don't meditate now, but I uh, got heavily into it in the 70s. And I remember there was a time in my life where I felt like everything is just kind of coming together and I did not find a way or couldn't find a way of keeping the things separate. So it was always when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it at the same time my bodybuilding career, I was thinking about my movie career, I was thinking about the documentary Pumping Out that we're shooting right now, and the movie Stay Hungry that we just finished shooting, and the, my investment in the apartment building, and is this going to, do I get the financing from the bank, and the, all of this kind of stuff was always coming together, and at the same time I was training for the Mr. Olympia competition in South Africa. And I was training right here at Gold's Gym. And I remember there was all the camera equipment around five hours a day in my face. And then someone in the middle of squatting was trying to change the battery pack <laughs> on, my, on my lifting belt and all this stuff. So yeah, it was like, uh, you know, eventually I felt like I got to do something about it because I have such great opportunities here. And everything is happening. And everything is going my way. But I'm just clustering everything into one big problem rather than separating it out and having calm and peace and, and being happy. And so I, by total you know, coincidence, I ran into this guy that I've run into many times on the beach, very, very pleasant man who uh, told me that he is a teacher in transcendental meditation. And I said, well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I feel like I should do something because I feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just overly worried and anxieties and all this stuff. Uh, and I feel like certain pressures that I've never felt before. And then he says, oh, he says, Arnold, it's not uncommon. It's very common. A lot of people go through this. This is why people use meditation, transcendental meditation, as one way of dealing with the problem. And he was very good in selling it because... He didn't say it's the only answer. He just is one of many. And he says, why don't you try it? He says, I'm a teacher there up in Westwood. I would not be able to teach you since we have a friend, we have, we have friends and we have met you. He says, there will be another teacher that will give you a mantra and blah, 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 and teach you how to do it. And then I can help you after that. Uh, he says, because I will be teaching up there. So why don't you come up on Thursday and I will be there. I will introduce you to the folks up there. And so then I went up there took a, a class, uh, and I went home after that and I then tried it. I said to myself, I've got to give it a shot. And I did 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. And I would say within um, 14 days, three weeks, I got to the point where I really could disconnect my mind and, uh, as they say, to find this few seconds of disconnection and rejuvenate the, 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 the mind and, um, and also learn how to focus more and to calm down. And uh, I did that for, it, and I saw the effect right away that I was much more calm about all of the challenges that were facing me. And um, I continued doing that then for a year. And by that time, I felt like, I think that I've mastered this. I think that now I don't feel overwhelmed anymore. Uh, and I really felt kind of it was one of the things where uh, you know, transcendental meditation was kind of anxiety and pressure meeting around the corner tranquility. You know, this is kind of what it, what it felt. And, um, and uh, so I was happy from that point. And even today, I still benefit from that because I don't merge and bring things together and see everything as one big problem. I take on one challenge at a time. And when I go and I study my script for a movie, then that time, that day when I study my script for a movie, I don't let anything else interfere in that and I just concentrate on that. So, and the, 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 the other thing that I've learned is that there's many forms of meditation in a way because like when I study and I work really hard where it takes the ultimate amount of concentration, I can only do it for 45 minutes maybe, 
maybe an hour. But then I have to kind of run off and maybe play chess. And I play chess for 15 minutes, and then I can go back and I have all the energy in the world again and jump right back and then continue on with my work as, as if I have not done it at all the day, right? It's like I'm fresh. And so that's another way, I think, of meditation. And then I also figured out that I could use my workouts as a form of meditation because I concentrate so much on the muscle and I have my mind inside the bicep when I do my curls. I have my mind inside the pectoral muscles when I do my bench press. So I'm really inside and it's like, again, a form of meditation because <clears throat> you have no chance of thinking or concentrating on anything else at that time but just that training that you do. And uh, so there's many ways of meditation and I benefit from all of those and I'm today much calmer because of that and much more organized and uh, much more tranquil because of that. This whole conversation makes me want to go tackle the world. I love it. And uh, I really appreciate all of your time. Where can people, and of course I'll link to all of these things in the show notes for folks, but where can people learn more about what you're up to? What would you like to share with people? Well, I think that uh, you know people, they know uh, my uh, ambitions in the movie business, you know, that, uh, that I love doing movies. But uh, I think because of my interest in public policy, uh, after my governorship, I have then started at USC, the USC Schwarzenegger Institute, that deals with some of the issues that I felt very passionate about during the time I was governor, and even beforehand, which was you know, political reform, um, you know, we, we, we were very successful in doing redistricting reform in California and open primaries and so on, which now brings uh, politicians much more to the center. But this is not the only thing. There's many more things that need to be accomplished in California and nationwide. So our institute deals with that. It also deals, you know, with stem cell research. It deals with uh, economic growth and opportunities. It deals with education, uh, after school programs, uh, programs and so on. And uh, especially also with environmental issues. And, uh, you know, I have an environmental organization on top of that, which is uh, the R20, uh, which deals uh, with subnational governments. Because I feel always very strongly that while we are striving towards a um, Kyoto 2 treaty, and where all the, the, the nations in the world come together, and I hope that they're going to be successful this year in Paris in December, um, I at the same time want subnational governments like California and, and other states and other provinces and cities to uh, set their own goals and not to wait just for this treaty, but to have the from the top down approach, which the international treaty will be, and from the bottom up, grassroots level approach from the bottom up, because when those two meet, then we really create critical mass. That's what it's all about. So I want to continue pushing towards a renewable energy future. It is my crusade. It's as much a crusade as my fitness crusade was for the last 45 years. And we've been pretty successful with that. Uh, so I hope that we're going to be successful with that too. But it does need everyone to buy in and everyone to participate. And that's why I go around the world and give speeches on environmental issues and try to bring countries together, make sure that this year it will be a huge success. But at the same time, have subnational governments set their own goals and do exactly what we did in California. In California, we didn't wait for Washington. We didn't wait for a UN treaty or anything like this. We set the goal of reducing our greenhouse gases by 20%, by 25% by the year 2020 and 85% by the year 2050. We created the million extra solar roofs in California. We lowered the fuel standards here. We set the goal to, to up the renewables from 25% to 48% by the year 2020. So these are all things that we did. Uh, we didn't wait for Washington, and so we want other states to do the same thing. And luckily, California showed great leadership, and now we see other subnational governments doing the same thing. And that's regions20.org? This is R20, yeah, regions20. And uh, people can find you on Twitter, at Schwarzenegger? That's right. Wonderful. All right. Uh, is there anything else that uh, <laughs> that you'd like to mention before we close out? Uh, yeah, uh, or Maze. We're doing another fundraiser. Uh, we do a maze and uh, the last time we did for the after school programs which we talked about earlier uh, I do fundraising all the time because they always need money and for every dollar we can sit you know send more kids to after school programs so uh, we're always raising money so the, the last time we had a tank 
drive and, and, and destroy things. Amazing, things amazing idea. Here. Yeah, there's a model tank right there behind you. Oh, yeah, there and this is. is. So the, the big tank, the real <laughs> tank, M47 from my military days, it's the real tank. So we basically, you know, whoever won the bid came out and you could sit with me in, a, in, a, uh, in the tank and then we crushed things together, pianos, toilet bowls, uh, living rooms and everything that, that, <laughs> that he picked. We just destroyed. And we raised over a million dollars from that, which was really great. And we had a lot of fun at the same time. This time, instead of, you know, destroying things with the tank, we blow things up. So this will be the new fundraiser, which we we're going to start, uh, I think, in very soon, as in February, as a matter of fact. So that's another thing that I'm doing is always raising money for the after-school programs. And is the is the link going to be the same as the last? Yeah, it'll be amaze.com/arnold. Okay, amaze.com slash Arnold. I'll put that in the show notes as well, sir. Good. Thank you so much for the thank time. Thank you very much. This has thank been you. wonderful. Thank you. Until next time, thank you for listening, folks. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. I will be putting links to all the books mentioned, resources, websites, etc. at 4hourworkweek.com forward slash Arnold. And if you enjoyed this episode, two things. Number one, I'm hoping to get some bonus questions answered from Arnold, and I'll be putting those on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Tim Ferriss, T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S, two R's and two S's. And if you enjoyed this episode, there are several others of mine that I think you will love. The first is with Tony Robbins, of course, advisor to people like Andre Agassi, top hedge fund managers, Bill Clinton, Serena Williams, the list goes on and on, about his morning rituals and routines, among many other things. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com forward slash Tony to check that out. And then my vote for the most interesting man in the world in real life is Kevin Kelly. And if you don't know who he is, or if you have heard the name before, either way, this is an incredible three-part episode. You got to check it out. It is fourhourworkweek.com forward slash Kevin. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Onnit. I have used Onnit products for years. If you look in my kitchen, in my garage, you will find Alpha Brain, chewable melatonin for resetting my clock when I'm traveling, kettlebells, battle ropes, maces, steel clubs. It sounds like a torture chamber, and it kind of is. It's a torture chamber for self-improvement. <laughs> and you can see all of my favorite gear at onnit.com forward slash Tim. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash Tim. And you can also get a discount on any supplements, food products. I like Hemp Force. I like Alpha Brain. Check it all out, onnit.com forward slash Tim. The Tim Ferriss Show is also brought to you by 99designs. 99designs is your one-stop shop for anything graphic design related. You need a logo, you need a website, you need a business card or anything else. You get an original design from designers around the world who submit drafts for you to review. You are happy or you get your money back. And I have used 99designs for book cover ideas for the 4-Hour Body, which went to number one New York Times, for banner ads. And you can check out some of my actual competitions at 99designs.com forward slash Tim. You can also get a free $99 upgrade if you want to give it a shot. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim.